So welcome to Profile 3 TV and today we're very excited to be joined by Hugh Campbell who is a retired site lead from Axom in Belfast. So thank you very much for taking time out to talk to us today and share your uh, wealth of experience with us. I know it's all my pleasure. Excellent. So you wouldn't mind telling, a, telling us a little bit of, about your background? Yeah, of course. Um, I um, qualified uh, in Scots Law uh, 30 years ago, back in 1988. Kind of frightening uh, to think about it. Um, I, I trained in, a, in a, a kind of niche corporate commercial firm in, in Glasgow. Uh, and then I moved um, after that as assistant to uh, McGregor's, uh, now uh, Pinson's. Um, when I was working there, I was approached by a client uh, in recruitment to uh, join a whiskey company um, called Invergordon Distillers Group, um, which had just uh, floated uh, on the stock exchange, if you pardon the pun. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, so at a, quite an early stage in my career, um, I, I, I kind of moved out of private practice into uh, commerce and industry. Um, I had uh, four very happy years there, but the company was uh, eventually taken over by uh, Jim Beam Brands and became part of the White Mackay uh, Whiskey Group. Um, and so uh, I was looking around and uh, I ended up joining uh, RBS Group uh, as uh, Deputy Secretary. Um, and I guess I spent the bulk of my career there, um, nearly 15 years. Uh, ending up as uh, head of uh, group secretariat, um, I'd like to claim I was prescient and um, you know saw the demise of that organisation coming. But I was approached about another role um, about six months before everything went uh, pear shaped, and uh, moved to a company called the Greco, uh, which uh, is an engineering group. Um, I, I worked there for a period of time. Uh, I was then with co-pension trustees, uh, the UK's third biggest pension scheme. Um, I then worked for a company called Intelligent Comms uh, as their uh, commercial director, a kind of telecoms expense management company. And uh, most recently, as, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, at Axiom in Belfast. So uh, I don't know whether it's a checkered career or, or varied, uh, you choose. Uh, no, no, amazing. Uh, what a wealth of experience and different roles and different challenges and, uh, and yes. different industries as well. So yeah. uh, very interesting. And, and your most recent role uh, in Axum then, what, what services did, well, what was yeah. that and what was the services that they as a company offer? Yeah, it, 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 interesting in, in the kind of legal services market. Axiom is one of a number of uh, legal services companies to emerge in recent years um, who, who's focused on um, merging the commercial contracting uh, work with technology. Um, so providing clients with a high quality but cost effective uh, uh, service. Um, the work they do falls into what I would categorizes as three main areas. Um, firstly, insourcing, uh, where they provide legally qualified individuals to support or um, enhance uh, a client's existing legal team. Um, perhaps if there's a maternity cover or if they need support in a, in a large um, acquisition or transaction. Um, Secondly, there's, there's outsourcing, which is the more traditional. Um, they set up a team you know, within Axiom to take on either part or all of a client's legal work. And then finally, what I would kind of categorize as projects, um, which are kind of shorter term team assignments, uh, where they complete a discrete piece of work. Um, you know, recent examples would be UMR or uh, due diligence for large acquisitions. Um, and the repapering for you know the data protection compliance, for example, and Brexit's obviously kind of high up the agenda, you know, at the moment. So um, those are the kind of three main areas. Um, Axiom's Belfast office focuses primarily on the outsourcing and the projects work. It doesn't really do um, in sourcing. Hmm. Amazing. And and then yourself, you were in the middle of all of this. Then that that was your role in. in... Yeah. Well, I, I joined. Axiom in 2014 in Belfast. At that time, 
Um, there was a team of 12 people. Um, I, now I think it's around about 200, 230. So kind of significant growth within that, that time. Um, and another good news uh, kind of story, I think, in the context of the growth of, of uh, professional services in Belfast. Um, but I, I joined in 2014, as I said, to set up and lead an outsourced uh, financial services team. Um, it was kind of multi-jurisdictional work covering a mix of legal contracting and um, specialist company secretarial and regulatory compliance work. Um, and then latterly, I, I was the site lead, so managed the whole Belfast uh, site office. Amazing. So um, quite an incredible role. And what, what obviously, you, I'm sure you dealt with so many challenges every day. Mm. Uh, never mind uh, uh, what's well, happening. Yeah, it was a good, I think, and again, this is something we, we might touch on later. Um, it... it, it made it so clear to me how important culture is in an organization and the ability to get things done and to grow something as rapidly you've got to have a, a you know very distinct and, and focused culture um where everybody is part of um and uh it, you know no no one person is going to succeed on their own it really is a collective effort and i think if you can harness that kind of energy you can you know you can do extraordinary things Incredible, and as you you say, you you've seen the growth from twelve people to yeah, <laughs> incredible. Yes. Well, uh, was there was there much? So again, we're we're going through ourselves a uh, uh, growth uh, phase. Nothing compared to that. <laughs> is is there is there, <laughs> is there uh, well maybe someday? But wow, maybe you, you see so many changes. Is there any tips, advice, or learnings you could share from what you've seen in your time uh, in in over here in Belfast? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it, it's important not to uh, not um, or I think it's important to uh, make sure that that you don't get too carried away with yourselves. That you you do things by incremental steps. Um, Otherwise, you, you know, you frighten yourself with the bigger, bigger picture. I think you've always got to keep the bigger picture in mind, but you also got to make it manageable. So breaking it down into bite-sized chunks rather than, um, you know, trying to deal with everything at once. Um, the ability to kind of prioritize um, and to keep prioritizing, you know, don't just, you know, have your list and then that's it. You've got to keep adapting and changing that. Um, and I think that, that it was almost, you know, by you know a, a sense of surprise, you turn around and look back and see what you've actually achieved. Um, because, and I think you would kind of frighten yourself and the organisation mm. if you, you, you know, you could have tried to explain what it was all going to look like, you know, within that that time frame. Um, but I think also, and and I can go back to my RBS experience. It's become quite clear to me over time that there are different types of leaders for different situations. Um, and I think you know people who are very good at growing businesses are not necessarily the best people at managing a steady state or dealing with um, you know market challenges. So I think you've got to be very clear uh, you know in terms of the type of people and the team that you put together to manage the organization's growth at a particular time because what works now might not necessarily work you know as you get get, get larger and i think you know the most important thing in senior management is to recognize that and to you know give people opportunities where um it, it, you know that their skills fit the, the growth of the business at that particular time Excellent. Incredible advice, just even the, to do things in small chunks as opposed to uh, trying to take on... Yeah, the, on rather the, get overwhelmed by, by, by the, you know, the, 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 the narrative um, to just work your way through. And, it's, you know, none of these things are straight line. You know, there will be steps, there'll be setbacks, um, there'll be challenges. Um, but again, it, 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 don't get phased by it. Know it's going to happen and deal with it. 
In, incredible. No, excellent. I, I, I guess you've done a, a lot of negotiating in your time. Yeah, reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Would, would you have any uh, negotiating tips or advice that you could share with us? Because uh, I'd be really appreciative. Yes. Well, I, I, I mean, I think there's, firstly, there's the universal maxim of be prepared. Um, I think it's the most important thing. Know what you want, what the ceiling is and what the floor is on price or people or whatever it is that you're, you're negotiating on. And be prepared to stick to these limits, but also be flexible within those. Um, I often think that too many people, you know, come into negotiation not being clear about what it is they exactly want, um, just hoping for the best. And, and, you know, at the end, nobody's really satisfied, you know, and it can become very frustrating for both parties. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that the art of compromise will always get you further than trying to bludgeon the, you know, the opposition into submission. Being a good negotiator is about uh, making sure you both end up with, you know, as much of what you each want so that nobody goes away feeling that they've, you know, lost. Um, otherwise, sooner or later, the deal you thought you had is, is going to fall apart and, and that's, you know, to no one's benefit. So, um, I think I've become more sanguine over time. I think, you know, when you are younger, you do tend to be much more, you know, bull in a china shop and, uh, you know, inclined to metaphorically or actually bang the table. But, uh, you know, I think really the best way is is understanding what Europe, you know, the, the opposition wants, being clear about what you want. And, and reaching some form of compromise because you're never going to get everything or you'll be very lucky if you do. Incredible. Good advice. I'll, I'll bear that in mind uh, as we continue to negotiate our way through <laughs> life, business and personal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and personal is just as important and maybe more so as well, but uh, what, to, what to do. I'm also sure in your time you've seen a lot of acquisitions, a lot yes. of, and uh, just in the industry you're in. Yeah. So, what would, you, what, would you, what would you describe or define as a business acquisition and how could they benefit yeah. a company? I mean, I think acquisitions either of, uh, you know, businesses or, or products or whatever, you know, it can certainly accelerate the growth of a company beyond what it might be able to achieve organically. Um, it can bring new business, new skills, new management. Uh, it can give diversity to what, what might be becoming a monoculture. Um, and it can provide a, a platform for exponential rather than incremental growth. Uh, and it can also help an existing team develop and keep them focused. Um, you know, I, I think RBS is a good and, you know, necessarily bad example of that in the sense the time that I worked there and the reason I think I was there for as long as I was is that it felt like you were working for a new company every three to four years because of the growth. Um, you know, development of things like direct line, um, you know, the, the acquisition of NatWest, the growth in the US, um, you know, all, all help to, you know, make it an interesting and dynamic place to be. Um, I think it also is evidence of the downside in that if growth becomes the, uh, by acquisition, becomes the main focus it can actually lead to your demise. And I think very much the ABN AMRO acquisition, um, which I was involved in in the initial stages, um, very much felt like it was a step too far. But we had a management structure that was so focused on acquisition that um, you know, it drove through something that ultimately, um, you know, I think the organization was going to be, obviously like all financial institutions massively affected by you know, the downturn and, 2007 2008 but it was certainly accentuated by the fact that it was making a you know had made a bad acquisition mm. so you know it, it, it's a kind of double-edged sword um uh and and you know there just needs to be you, you you need to have a tempering influence and i think that's where in most companies uh, a strong board um can help uh, you know, make sure that, that a strong management, um, you know, re re remains focused and, uh, you know, helps it to avoid mistakes in that area. Very good. Very interesting. And you, you're talking about the, the management of the business and it moving forward. 
obviously you've had a lot of leadership roles in your career as well. So I, I, I know you have the, the golden answer uh, oh. to, to, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, to, to this, but uh, what, what, what in your opinion makes a good leader then? Yeah, well, I think I found as I moved into more senior roles, uh, and this will probably you know resonate with others that as a result, over time you become less directly involved in the day to day in, in in my world, the technical legal work. So you have to rely on colleagues rather than yourself in terms of actual service delivery. Um, so while you can read all the kind of management books you want the reality is most of us learn by doing and have to learn quickly you know when we move into a management position and i think the main thing that stood me in good stead uh, was having the confidence to delegate um let other people get on with their job you know because they know the technical details rather than trying to micromanage them um but very importantly you know support your team so they know you've got their back. And there will be occasions when you do have to take a bullet for them. Uh, but that's your job, your senior management. And, it, you know, that, 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 that will happen. I would say spend more time listening than talking. But do communicate regularly. Um, you know, one-to-one -one meetings, team meetings, um, office communications, um, you know, are, are are fundamental to again this whole thing about culture and, and, and keeping people, um, uh, uh, you know, with you, and also keeping you close to what's going on, but without stifling your colleagues. So you know, I think essentially build and keep trust. You know, without trust, um, you'll fail. Your colleagues have to trust you, and you have to trust them. Um, and I think that. With that, you can achieve a lot. Very interesting. Excellent. I, I guess, again, throughout your career, you've seen some uh, very interesting situations uh, <laughs> and uh, have had to, I'm sure, do long days, long nights, a lot of travel and um, yeah. motivation, something that we all go through. Uh, it's, it's hard to maintain and keep at a constant level. So, so how, how yeah. did you, throughout your career, keep, keep motivated and see others around you maintain motivation? Yeah, well, I, I, I think, um, like most, you know, I was driven initially by just keeping a roof over my head and putting food on the table. That's the, let's never lose sight of the fundamentals. Um, <laughs> but I think if you find you're good at something or you're interested, in, it doesn't feel like you're being driven. Um, it's just doing what you enjoy doing. Um, I've always enjoyed working with people um, and also think the type of work I've done, whether at legal or company secretarial, um, it tends to lead you being focused on getting the small stuff right. I mean, particularly in the kind of company secretarial regulatory world, um, there are a few grey areas. Something's either right or it's wrong. Um, and that tends to drive, I mean, maybe even a slightly OCD approach to, you know, to getting the detail right. Um, but I, th I, th I think that that, I think if you've got that kind of personality, and I think I've been fortunate to mix that focus on detail, but the interest in people. So, you know, I, I think that mixture has, has stood me in good stead. Excellent, excellent. And and uh, have you seen uh, many setbacks or witnessed or oh, had any on the on the, on the trip? I, I was I hoping you were going to tell me some goals. Everybody says no to that's lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I think we often learn more from when things do go wrong than, than when something goes right. Um, if there's anything I uh, you know I could pass on, it's never, um, never take a jo job just for the money. Um, in one of my roles, I followed the dollar, ignoring the kind of, or at least rationalizing away, um, you know, concerns which came up during the interview process. Um, I ended up lasting just a year in that role, and I came close to making myself physically ill in the process. Mm. And it made me realize how important culture is in the workplace. And if you don't fit with an organization's particular culture, there's no amount of money is going to compensate you for it. Mm. Um, I'm pleased to say that, you know, since that experience, I've enjoyed each role I've had. 
um, but I've been very careful to make sure the company's values and mine are, are aligned. Um, so, yeah, that, that was definitely one of the things that, that, you know, learning from a negative rather than positive, but um, I think, you know, a, an important lesson. Excellent. Very interesting. One to note. Uh, brilliant. So, <laughs> yes, you, you've such a wealth of experience and you've, you've seen and, and uh, achieved a lot. Uh, you, you don't have uh, itchy feet and uh, aren't tempted to dip back in and uh, into the corporate world. Well, yeah, I mean, at the moment, I'm enjoying the novelty of, you know, retirement. <laughs> uh, my wife says it's definitely temporary. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've I worked away from home and, and uh, home being in Scotland um, for the past five years. Um, so I've really been a case of catching up with, you know, the jobs that I never quite got around to, you know, when I, when I was uh, away. Um, but I'm conscious that that is definitely a finite list. Um, so I, I suspect that in the new year, I will be looking to get back in the saddle. Um, I'm now in the fortunate position where I can choose what I do. Uh, and I'd like to send a look at roles where I can give back rather than, you know, looking to, to, to have a career as such. Um, so that's the theory. Um, I'll reserve judgment to see what actually happens. Excellent. Let's see. He is right. So, so if anyone wanted to reach out and get in touch, what yes. would be the, the best way for them to do that? Well, I am on uh, LinkedIn uh, and, and I do, you know, check, check that regularly. So um, if, if anybody wants to, you know, to contact me, then more than happy to engage with them through that. Excellent. And we have a link underneath the, the video, of course. Uh, so anyone uh, can yeah, of course, that's good. and have a chat. Well, excellent. Well, well again, well, thank you very much for taking time out to talk to us today. It's been brilliant. Not at all. My pleasure. Excellent. So uh, I've learned a lot. I'm going to have to rewatch this, I think, a few times. <laughs> and, uh, uh, there's some sage advice in, in, in our chat today. So, no, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure it'll help a lot of people. So thank you for that. Not at all. All the best. Brilliant. Excellent.